Every year, millions of acorns never become oak trees. Well, because they're eaten by deer or because they landed on a sidewalk where they dried out, because they landed among weeds and got choked out when they became little trees, or even because they got stomped on or mowed over in a high traffic area. Maybe somebody didn't think a tree belonged there. So clearly, it's no simple feat to go from being an acorn to a mature oak tree. It's also no simple feat to go from being a child to grow into a mature, God-honoring adult. So please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Today's verses are on page 579. You need one of the Bibles under the chairs in front of you, page 579. It's my delight to tell you that for about 20 years now, I've maintained the little tree nursery. For, the first, for a few years, I kept some of the trees here in the church's community garden. So I've learned that in order to go the distance <laughs> and become a mature oak tree, an acorn requires some careful attention. So keep in mind, though, that acorns don't have a choice as to whether they receive sunlight or moisture, and they don't have the capacity to accept it or reject it. Children, however, do have a choice to receive or reject wise and loving training from their parents. Well, God's word says it like this in Hebrew, excuse me, in Proverbs chapter 12. It says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. It's in the Bible. <laughs> well, God commands children to receive wise and loving training from their parents. So this implies, of course, that parents are to give wise and love tra loving training to their children. So parents, God entrusts children to us to train them to grow and become mature adults who love and serve him. Well, not all of us are children and not all of us are parents with children in the home, but all of us can play a vital role in equipping the next generation to love and serve God. So the broader context of these verses in Ephesians we've been seeing, uh, there's also a, a word for the whole church here too. So would you pray with me as we open God's word together? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's life to us. Uh, God, I ask that you would work uh, through your word today. God, I've asked that you would grant me the humility to exceed any gifting you have entrusted to me. And God, that you would form in me character that would exceed any influence you have entrusted to me. And so God, have your way. Let your preached word accomplish your work for your glory. And please come soon. Amen. I'm going to just point out that the section of God's Word that we're walking through over last week and this week and next week it presents ways that we can submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, as we saw in verse 21 of chapter 5. So it's kind of unpacking what that means. So the submission's not a reciprocal submission in the sense that, you know, children can't make demands on their parents or discipline their parents, but it's a mutual submission. So in some sense, a husband submits to his wife by, by serving her, his aim is to protect her and provide for her and, and nourish her spiritually. Similarly, in a sense, parents submit to their children, those of you with young kids know this very well, that your lives are all about meeting the spiritual and emotional and physical needs of your children. So the context of today's verses uh, includes a description of uh, opportunities to live out this reverence for Christ in various relationships. So the first four verses of Chapter 6, Address Children and Parents. This is God's Word. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. What strikes me is that children are addressed here as part of the church. Children are people too. <laughs> so we value children here at Trinity. And we aim to partner with all the parents who are working to train up the next generation in the Lord's ways. So children, I will be addressing you mostly this morning. So God's word promises that there's great value in obeying and honoring your parents. So to do something in the Lord is to do something as unto the Lord. So children are commanded to obey their parents as they would obey the Lord himself. So children, following Jesus and obeying Jesus is for you too. So parents, you are loving your children well 
when you help them to see that their obedience to you is training them for obedience to the Lord. So learning to obey your God-given authority will train your children to obey the Lord's authority over them as they grow into mature adulthood. So, children, today's verses give you two reasons uh, to obey your parents in the Lord. First of all, because it is right. And second, because it's good for you. So first, obeying your parents in the Lord is right. It's a right thing to do. So, children, this won't come as a surprise to you, but you didn't create yourselves. In fact, your parents didn't create you either. God created you His way for His purpose, and God entrusted you to your parents so that you would be trained in your childhood. And it's no secret that some adults in this broken world encourage children to live as if they created themselves. You've heard it. Rebellion against God in this broken world has brought things so far that some people even say that children get to decide if they're a boy or a girl. This is absolute foolishness because it's a, God's word says clearly that God created boys to grow into men and, and girls to grow into women. This is God's truth. So children, you cannot live as if you created yourself because you'll always need the things God created you for, like food and drink and sleep and air to breathe that point you to him. God created you with those moment-by-moment -moment reminders that he created you his way for his purpose. So you'll always need everything that he gave you to live, including his good commands. So God's word says that he declares what is right. So since God declares what is right, obeying his commands is always the right thing to do for children and for parents. So children among us, the first good reason to obey your parents in the Lord is that it's the right thing to do. Second, obeying your parents in the Lord is good for you. God gave the Ten Commandments to his people after he had already chosen them, delivered them from slavery in Egypt. So these Ten Commandments were to guide their relationship with him and their relationship with one another as they entered the promised land, the land that God promised their ancestors. Well, the fifth of those Ten Commandments was this. Honor your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Well, we know the story. The people soon rejected God's commands. It didn't go well with them, and they were not long in the land. By the time Ephesians was written about 1,400 years later, generation after generation of God's people had already disobeyed their way out of God's protection and blessing. So they're now living under the oppression of the Roman Empire. But even still, the promise in today's verses gives us the principle that obeying God's commands is always good for us, children, parents, and everyone else in this room. The principle is not tied to geography. The principle is that children who obey their parents in the Lord are assured that it will ultimately go well for them because they will enjoy eternal life through Christ, God's promised Redeemer. Maybe you can relate to this. Sometimes when we're children, we think that our parents make up rules just to stop us from having fun. <laughs> well, pastor and author Kevin DeYoung says that God's commands are not like prison bars, but like traffic laws. Just think, if there were not things in place like stop signs and speed limits and parking spaces, just think of the chaos. If everybody could just drive however they felt like, think of the danger and just the carnage. There'd be accidents everywhere. So God's commands really are good for us. So God commands children to receive wise and loving training from their parents. So children, obey your parents in the Lord because it's the right thing to do and because it's good for you. So children, in addition to obeying your parents with your actions... God's word commands you also to honor your parents with your attitude in your heart. So to honor your parents is to treat them with a proper respect based on who they are and based on the, the role that God has entrusted to them in your life. So truly honoring your parents means obeying right away, all the way, with a grateful heart. So children, when you obey your parents right away, it shows that you trust them and you know that they are in charge. I just want to stop and say, by way of application, if you're an adult in this room, like you don't need to skip this part because God is your father. 
you are a child of God if you're a Christian. This applies to us too. So, so children really can trust that whatever your parents give you to eat at the breakfast table is good for you. Good parents do not put poison in their kids' breakfast cereal. So you can also trust that their, their rules, your parents' rules, are good for you because they love you. Parents give you and do for you good things. So learning to trust and obey your parents, children, is a good practice to help you learn to trust and obey God. In the church, parents, others, you play a vital role, a vital role in this. Because insisting that your, parent, your children obey right away, rather than saying, well, if I have to count to three, insisting your, parent, your children honor you by being right away is good for your children. Help them learn to trust God. So children, when you also obey your parents all the way, this also shows that you trust your parents and that, that they, they know and they want what's best for you. When children, or adults who are children of God, only partially obey their parents, in the case of a child, maybe like going to bed and then sneaking out later because, you know, you know better than your parents, it shows that either you don't think that, or that, that they know better than you or that you really don't fully trust that they love you. What about it, adults? When we disobey God, what does it really say? We know better? Or we really don't trust that his commands are good? Or we really don't trust that he loves us? Are his commands prison bars or traffic laws? So children, in, in addition to obeying your parents uh, with your actions, God words, God's word commands you to uh, honor, him, honor them with your attitude in your heart. So, so truly honoring your parents means obeying not just right away, all the way, but also with a grateful heart. So parents who set reasonable rules before their children and consistently uh, train their children to follow these rules do this for the good of the children. They, they do it because they love the children. Every parent knows that training a child in the discipline and instruction of the Lord is much more difficult than just ignoring the child. <laughs> So, so any parent who makes any effort whatso whatsoever is an expression of love. It's, it, it's so much easier just to ignore the child. So children growing up in loving homes with reasonable rules are experiencing a parent's sacrificial love. And children, you have much to be thankful for. So children, if that describes your home, a, a wise and right response to that training and that discipline is to honor your father and mother by obeying right away, all the way, with a grateful heart. It'll be good for you. Well, today's verses also have a word for fathers. We see in verse 4, fathers are called to lead the charge, but both parents must work together, certainly, to train and discipline their children in the Lord's ways. We do this by aiming at our children's hearts, at their, their attitudes, not just their actions. We're not just correcting behavior. We're, we're aiming at the hearts of our children that they would know and love Jesus. So the word says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Well, not provoking your child to anger is much more than just not escalating an argument and, oh, Dad, you made me mad. This, this is a warning. This is a warning. There's a fork in the road. That this is where your children will end up if you're not bringing them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So not provoking your children to anger does not just mean that, oh, you have to make sure that nothing ever troubles them. I, I want to make sure they get everything they want so they aren't provoked to anger. No, if a child's about to touch a hot stove, no parent sits there and thinks, oh man, I want my little one to exercise that freedom to choose whether or not the stove is hot. That stove is hot. And your child's going to get hurt seriously if he or she touches that stove. So when a parent recognizes the serious consequences of disobedience, the most loving thing to do is whatever it takes to train and discipline your child to turn from that which would truly harm him. So as Christian parents, that's our worldview. What would truly harm him is remaining the enemy of God that he was born into. So dads, if you're like me, you recognize you can do all sorts of dumb things that provoke your child to anger, often by accident or forgetfulness. But consistent, loving discipline is not one of them. 
In fact, meeting your child's need for a consistent loving discipline is the opposite of provoking your child to anger. There's a fork in the road here. Great hope for us in Christ is if you're walking down one, you recognize it by God's grace, you can opt to the other one and he'll empower you to walk down that road in faith. Well, the book of Proverbs has much to say about making this, making this effort to train and discipline your children. Proverbs chapter 13 says this. It says, whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. So again, I say parenting, parents, withholding discipline from your child is not loving them well. So, so for those of your kids, you remember getting grounded or getting a time out, and, you don't love me. Oh, no, that's an expression of your parents' love. They're protecting you. They're guarding you from great harm. So learn to trust and obey your parents. Proverbs chapter 19 adds this. It says, discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. <laughs> Think of what that says. That not disciplining your child is giving up on him. It's setting your heart on putting him to death. Go ahead. I'll ignore you. Go ahead. Can you imagine? Well, the great news is that because of who Jesus is and because of what he accomplished for all who believe, there is hope. There is hope. Discipline your son, for there is hope. Discipline is not in vain. There is hope that your child would see and know Jesus. God, the eternal son, who took on flesh to live and die and rise again in his place, that he would have a restored relationship with God the Father. So there's an aim here. There's a place we're going with discipline and instruction in the Lord. There is hope. It's never in vain. This is our hope in parenting. The gospel is always our hope. So he who overcame sin and death is able to rescue us and transform us, and transform our children for his glory. So Jesus is our Lord. He is our one true hope. As we tap the pause button here, we think, oh, there, there's got to be a lot of benefits. There's got to be a lot of benefits of, of bringing up children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. As a somewhat sarcastic courtesy to parents, I humbly offer seven stepping stones to provoking your child to anger. So if you're into that, you want to provoke your child to anger, just, just do one or more of these things and you'll provoke your children to anger. So parents, if you want to ignore God's commands for the role that he's entrusted to you with that little mini-me, just do one or more of these things. Do it consistently and you can be confident that your child will grow into an adult who's filled with rage. In fact, as the Proverbs say, He'll shake his fist. He'll rage and scoff at God. So here are seven steps to get you there. First, ignore your children. Ignore them. Hey, the children are born thinking they don't need parents. And they're pretty much little, you know, adults in little bodies anyway, right? So just go ahead and ignore them. Just completely ignore your responsibility that God has entrusted to you. Either the child will figure it out on, on his own. Or someone else will jump in and help them figure it out. Uh, and you know, give them whatever they need. And then as your child grows into an adult, you ignoring them will eventually provoke your child to anger, anger at you and anger at God. It's very simple. One well, acorn will try to sprout up and put roots down wherever it spends the most time. Even on a sidewalk, you get enough moisture, it's going to start a little sprouting out, trying to go down. It's not going to go anywhere because it's on concrete. Spiritually healthy children generally sprout from the soil of a spiritually healthy marriage and family life. So, beloved of God, may it never be said of us that we stood by and watched while the world molded our children. So, parents, let's be intentional. Be intentional about building a healthy relationship with your child. Good rule of thumb to keep in mind, a couple R's here to remember, is that remember that rules without a relationship will result in rebellion. Rules without a relationship will result in rebellion. Maybe you observe that in your home or others. Well, a second way to provoke your child to anger is to aim for her approval by trying to be her friend instead of her parent. So I remember in high school one time, there's this girl uh, who, whose mom dressed like her and tried to act like her and talk like her. And even then there's a bunch of us going, this just doesn't seem right. 
And by the way, she, this girl, the high school girl, she just got away with just about everything. So your goal as a parent is not to be your child's buddy, but to train up an adult who will delight to follow Jesus with you. These are adults. These are, these are miniature adults. These are children who are, I should say, miniature adults. They're, they're acorns to be grown into mature trees. They're, they're children whom God has entrusted to you that they would know and love Jesus and follow him with you. So another sure way to provoke your child to anger is to make unreasonable demands. You know, ask your child to do things he's not capable of doing. Like asking a two-year-old to sit quietly for three hours while you sit and talk to a friend and then keep speaking harshly, keep speaking harshly to him when he can't do it, when he can't sit still for those three hours. Fourth, an equally effective way to provoke your child to anger is to never establish or communicate clear boundaries. A few weeks ago, Pam and I went to Fond du Lac to the little soccer complex there for our grandson, Braden's soccer game. He's 13. So the ball seemed to go out of bounds, and people would say it was out of bounds. Oh, no, it wasn't out of bounds. And I just dreamed for, briefly, what would that be like if the kids are playing soccer in a field with no boundaries? How angry they would be, and how crazy it would be to even have refs there and say the ball went out of bounds. No, it didn't. The refs didn't even disagree with each other. Just imagine. If, if no boundaries on the soccer field was marked. So, so if you want to provoke your child to anger, picture that soccer field and don't establish or communicate clear boundaries for appropriate behavior with a child. Just let them go. Do, do their own thing. And then just discipline sporadically. How to provoke them to anger. Well, along with uh, refusing to establish and communicate clear boundaries, you can move the goalposts. Just think of how this would have been maddening for these, these young teenagers playing soccer. So in your home, this might look like insisting that your daughter does the dishes before she goes over to her friend's house. And then after she does the dishes and grabs her keys and is about to head out the door, you say, ah, you didn't fold the laundry. You're staying here until you fold the laundry. That's a good way to provoke your daughter to anger. Or if you prefer not to provoke your child to anger, establish clear expectations and consequences in your home. A sixth way to provoke your child to anger is to respond with severity. So when your child disobeys, your child disappoints you, don't just calmly and kindly stick to the facts and shepherd them and talk it through. Go overboard. Use abusive language. Shame your child. Dole out very severe discipline. It won't take long and your child will be provoked to anger. Or if you prefer to walk in wisdom, Consider Psalm 103. It says, As a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So you could extend the same gracious understanding to your children when they disappoint you. Christian parent, remember the log in your own eye. Remember the insurmountable debt of sin that Jesus erased on the cross for you and deal tenderly with your children as you shepherd them in the Lord's ways. A seventh way I thought of to provoke your child to anger is by setting a poor example. You know, this is the classic page out of the parenting handbook, the do as I say, not as I do. So, so w insist that your parent, your child respectfully submits to your authority all the time, is right after you cuss out a police officer or talk trash about your boss at work. Great way to provoke your child to anger. Parents, your influence is inescapable. It's inescapable. Your children are watching. So whatever your children observe, you finding your identity in or, or setting your hope on is what they're going to learn to find their identity in and to set their hope on. So parents, if you're not training your child through loving discipline and careful instruction, you are on a path to provoke your child to anger. If you're doing your best, by God's grace, learning as you go, trying to train your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, God will honor that. God will honor that. So for parents, for parents who provoke or prefer not to provoke their children to anger, Please know that God's word equips us and encourages us to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He is able. And you're surrounded by a church family who is for you and with you and wants to partner with you in this. 
Well, this verb translated bring them up in, uh, is the same word translated as nourish in uh, verse 29 of chapter 5. Remember, a husband uh, nourishes his wife. God's word speaks of a husband's responsibility to love his wife as he loves himself, nourishing and cherishing her, his own body, just as Christ does his church because we're members of his body. That word nourish in this verse is translated bring them up. Last fall, I collected a dozen or so acorns in the hope that I could bring them up in my little tree nursery. Well, just as every acorn that grows is brought up and puts roots down into some kind of soil, every child is brought up and puts roots down into the instruction of something, whatever is around them. Children will learn from whatever kind of instruction that surrounds them. Just to be clear, the Bible teaches that children are not born neutral, but sinful. Jeremiah chapter 17 says this. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? In fact, our heart even deceives us into thinking that we're righteous before God. Proverbs chapter 13 gives two options for parents, as I said earlier. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. So in Scripture, the rod refers to discipline. This isn't some abusive beating. This is a corrective, loving discipline. So Christian parents who love their children are diligent to discipline them. So as we've already seen, corrective discipline is just one part of this whole picture of bringing up children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Well, enduring discipline is not pleasant for anyone. No one likes it. And discipline, frankly, is not beneficial for everyone. In fact, uh, Scripture distinguishes between two groups. Discipline is beneficial for some and not others. So parents, we need to teach our children to receive wise and loving training for their good. So Hebrews chapter 12 says it like this. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. So children who remain hard-hearted and refuse to be trained by corrective discipline will not experience the peaceful fruit of righteousness. There's a cherry tree in our front yard that I planted nearly 10 years ago. Uh, it was forked about 18 inches off the ground, so I had to prune it. I had to choose one or the other. Otherwise, it would just grow in the uh, shape of a V and then it would break and the, the tree would be ruined within probably 10 years. So you can still see the evidence of where I cut, that cherry tree is growing tall and strong. It's one of the most beautiful trees in our yard. You see a picture on the screen there. It looks bent. Well, what happens there is this little, a little scab from where I had to cut one side off, and then the rest went out and then started growing up straight again. So it recovered from that discipline. It recovered from that pruning and is working to grow up, grow up straight. So Proverbs chapter 1 says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the ultimate aim of parenting is, is to equip and encourage our children to grow into an adult who loves and serves God. So part of this process is teaching a child to receive and to seek and to, to love, to cherish wise and loving instruction of parents. So this year we're doing a catechism. Even still, some of us hear the word catechism and we just have this kind of gut response from some bad memory of childhood. But it's good. It's good. To catechism or to, to catechize is to instruct someone in the, uh, God's truth in an orderly way. So the, the authoritative instruction of God's word is essential to growing a vibrant life in Christ. And so that's what we do this. Every Sunday we sing and we celebrate it. We talk about it. We pray about it every Sunday and, and certainly uh, throughout the week. So Christian catechisms have instructed uh, people, uh, generations of Christians over the years. It usually it's in the form of a question and an answer. So that's what we do as we begin gathered worship each Sunday throughout 2022. So parents, God your Father has something for you in this. God, God is even catechizing you. God is instructing you as you instruct your children. God is for you, parents. He is with you. He loves you. He has something for you. He's forming the character of Christ in you, even through all the ups and downs of parenting. 
and say, oh, this is, this is new to me. I, I don't know how to do this. I, I, I'm not sure where to start with my kids. Well, I'll read a chapter of Proverbs every day. There's 31 chapters. Read one chapter a day. Pick one or two of them. Discuss it together. God's word is clear that there are two institutions established by God who are responsible for discipleship of the children. The next generation, that's the home and the church. We read in Psalm um, 145 earlier, the church plays this role of celebrating the works of God. But it starts with the parents. So everyone here plays an important role in supporting Christ-centered homes and families. So we're to love and serve one another well as a church family. And it's my delight. I, as I say often, I brag about you all the time. I go to pastor's lunches. I brag about Trinity all the time. I'm blessed beyond measure to be on this journey with you. What a treasure to me. So young parents, young parents among us, I encourage you to build relationships with the more experienced parents among us. They have much to offer. Pam and I have discovered that and been so blessed in so many ways. Older parents, grandparents, you might need to take the initiative. Most young parents, if you'll recall, if you were ever a young parent, you're up to your eyeballs in responsibility. You're just trying to keep your head above water. So I encourage you, uh, uh, parent, uh, older parents or grandparents, take the initiative. Pursue the younger families in the church and uh, spend time with them and invest in their children. I want to say that Pam and I have been so blessed beyond measure. So many of you have invested in our sons, walked alongside us through all the ups and downs of parenting. We're so grateful to be a part of a church like Trinity that really uh, works together to train up the next generation in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So thank you. So that's my hope. That was my prayer this week as I walked through these chairs, that, that God would work so powerfully that all the children among us would put down deep roots in the Word of God and they would grow into maturity like a majestic oak tree for the glory of God. May it be so among us with every new generation. Beloved of God, children, parents, church family, to all of you, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. Go in peace with this great God. You are loved.